Hello and welcome to our school. So starting off, we start with quite an obvious question that you will probably be quite tired of by the end of New Year, which is how does it feel to earn the Nobel Prize? <laughs> Strange. Uh, I feel that I have been accidentally transported into some alternate universe where <laughs> reality no longer exists. Very, very strange. <laughs> Are you satisfied with uh, earning the Nobel Prize or having a mountain named after you? Because apparently there is a mountain in Italy that is named after you. Uh, it, it's not a mountain, it's, only a, it's just a rock. <laughs> About, what, five meters high? <laughs> uh, it just so happened that uh, I was, we were driving up in, in the uh, long, in the Val d'Orco in Italy, uh, and I was young at the time, a bit stupid and young, and uh, I saw this boulder with a crack in it. And I yelled, "Stop the car!" Uh, put on my climbing shoes and managed to climb this crack. And it turned out that none of the local climbers could repeat that cr uh, crack for about ten years or so. And the reason for this was because. I'd learned to all the necessary techniques in England, so I had uh, um, some 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 climbing techniques which the local climbers simply didn't know. So I had an, adv had an advantage. Uh, I've heard that you feel you got to work with David Thewlis by coincidence. Why is that? Oh, all right. I was a postdoc in high energy physics in Torino in Italy. My plan was to then get another postdoc position at CERN in Geneva. However, as is my usual um, lazy, uh, due to my laziness, I failed to get the paperwork in on time, so I didn't get uh, at the job I expected to in Geneva. So I was basically unemployed. And then I thought, okay, better find another job. So I my wife uh, went, walked down to the, the railway station and bought an English newspaper f for the job advertisements. And I filled in all the job applications I could find. and. Uh, was accepted at Birmingham, so I went there. And of course, at the time, it was the last place I wanted to be, but it was actually the best, m you know, best move I uh, could make, and uh, the rest is sort of history. So, are you glad you got to work with David Dulles then? Oh yeah, very glad, because um, no, he, had, he has the most uh, amazing mind, you know, it, it's a mind that operates on a, on a level, you know, above almost everybody else, and so uh, his ideas and uh, you know, just general insights into physics were a major education. And if we hadn't worked together, this w wouldn't have happened. For how long have you been interested in physics? Oh, longer than I like to think. Um, I've basically been in physics all my life. Okay. And it was, the, you know, it's one of, uh, at, at, at school, uh, when I was educated in Britain, you know, I sort of learnt uh, all languages, history, geography, uh, math, science, etc. But I re disliked uh, the humanities and the languages because it was too much memory involved. And I like to say that I can remember perhaps 10 facts at any one time, but I'm not too sure about the last four. So I have to work with the six things I can remember. And maths and science are just about doable. 
with the, when you remember very little but but have some ability to work things out and so that's why basically why I went into the sciences did you believe back when your findings were published in the 70s that you would earn the Nobel Prize oh good good Lord no 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 <laughs> Did you at any point uh, believe that this was something Nobel Prize worthy? Well, when we did the work, as far as I was concerned, it was just uh, an entertaining theoretical problem. And of course, we were very pleased that we managed to do it and work it out, but uh, it took a while before I realized that it had seemed to have applications to other systems and it was a theory which gave some exact numerical um, predictions, measurable predictions, and then the ex uh, key experiment was done in what, 1978 or something which actually verified our theory. So at that point, I thought, well, maybe. It uh, certainly is a, a nice theory because it's one of the few theories that gives a prediction that can be measured. Uh, and you know, I thought, well, maybe it's, it's, it's better than we thought, but... Uh, it never occurred to me that it would, would get, get get to this level. Did you perhaps f think that it might be worthy of some local price or university price or something like uh, that? Yeah, well, it was. I mean, we got the won the Maxwell Medal in Britain and the Lars Onsager Prize from the American Physical Society. So I knew it was good uh, by this stage, and. Then the, the, the applications start coming, uh, experimental applications started coming thick and fast. So, yes, and, uh, and also it got a lot of, um, you know, citations, but possibly one of the most cited papers um, written. I can't remember how many, how many times it's been cited in the literature, but it must be approaching uh, you know, several thousand anyway, which is amazing for a scientific paper. So, yes, it was something which clearly had uh, got some attention and it was clearly correct what we'd done, but it's impossible to tell whether something is, is ever going to get the Nobel Prize. So, how do you think your discoveries can be used? Now, I was afraid of that question <laughs> <laughs> because you see, as a theoretical physicist, I don't think about applications. So, it's not clear to me what it, it may or may not be applica applicable to because it is a strictly theoretical exercise. At the moment, I guess you can say that it does explain some phenomena which you know, really puzzled people before earlier. For example, for those people who are you know, interested in studying strange things, or, you know, like in two dimensions. I mean, who cares about a two-dimensional fluid or a two-dimensional solid? Okay, but if you're a theoretical physicist, you think about stupid things like that. And there were some rigorous theorems around which said that, or seemed to say that a two-dimensional superfluid or a two-dimensional crystal cannot exist. Now, uh, no, but but this was just because the this rigorous math these rigorous mathematical theorems are certainly correct, but they were just misinterpreted, and so 
what David and I did was we sort of sat, sat down and thought about things and realized that okay so let me let me back off a minute the one standard picture of a crystal is you know at atoms or particles on a particular regular lattice and so in other words if you know what one particle is in the crystal you know where all the others are <coughs> however such a idea simply doesn't work in two dimensions because of the the effects of um, uh, vibrations and so on and so the positions of the atoms are really not well related to each other because two particles which were far apart in the crystal are going to diverge uh, uh, from the original positions by by an amount which is enormous amount and therefore you would say crystal can't exist in two dimensions but we thought well no wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute that's not you know the essence of a crystal the essence of a crystal is that it's a solid it's an elastic solid in other words it has a it's a it's a thing which if you try to um sh you know take one side of the crystal push it one way and the other side you know push the other way shear it is called then a solid will ha has a, a resistance to this this um, sort of shearing force or stress as it's called technically whereas a fluid like water if you take you know a jug of water and forget about the jug if you take one edge of the water and try to move it that way and the other edge you try to move it that way it'll move without any you know applying any force at all because it it has no shear she resistance to shear so therefore what would distinguish a crystal from a f from a fluid is really this this so-called shear modulus and so we concentrated on that um, and it's an analogous uh, quantity in a so-called su superfluid which is uh, another system which again uh, is easier to think of it's a simpler system and so we, we we decided that it's worthwhile looking at these systems in two dimensions because clearly they could exist and they would be you'd have to change one's way of looking at uh, solids and liquids in two dimensions from the standard way of looking at them and so that is what we actually developed you see what I mean uh, so are you afraid of any possible military applications your discoveries might have no I can't imagine a military uh, um, application but what do I know I mean <laughs> your father was also a scientist active in the biochemistry field how did this impact your life um, Well, it certainly got me interested in science, but I remember an experience as a, as, a, as a fairly young child which turned me off biological um, research because my father took me, used to take me into his lab some, some, from time to time and I don't know, 10, 11 years old, so, something of that order. And one day I was in there, now so let me just say that Remember, these are the old days when the rules and regulations were a little bit less uh, stringent than they are today. And so I was walking around his lab and happened to look in a, a Saturday morning or something, I happened to look in a waste paper basket, and there was this dead cat in it <laughs> with its uh, skull, um, you know, its brain exposed. And I thought, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. If that's the sort of thing you do, uh, experiments you do in biology, I I certainly you know don't want to do that sort of thing. <laughs> but I was interested in science, so I drifted into um, you know, physics, uh, phys maths, and physics, where that that sort of uh, 
experience wouldn't would unlikely to occur. <laughs> so besides mountaineering and um, obviously your scientific work, uh, what other interests do you have? No. <laughs> like music, like reading a lot, um, f you know, family, friends, usual stuff. <laughs> okay. uh, would you describe yourself as a workaholic? Uh, I don't think so, but my wife may disagree. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> if I get, you know, I really get into some problem, uh, which, you know, I, which really bothers me, I can't leave it alone, then I guess I might turn into a workaholic because I mean, my wife tells me I was in my younger days be, be simply because um, if I went out for a meal or something, I'd have this paper napkin and suddenly I'd reach for the paper napkin and start writing something on it and then you know, stuff it in my pocket and look at it later. But so I didn't consider myself a, a workaholic, but my wi as I said, my wife might disagree. <laughs> so a non-workaholic day... Uh, how would that look compared to a workaholic day? Oh. <laughs> well, in my younger days, I would, at weekends, I'd go rock climbing and spend, uh, the, you know, two days sitting on ledges on, on a cliff somewhere holding ropes. <laughs> and then on f Monday to Friday, I'd be uh, <laughs> working. So I guess that... I suppose that lifestyle could be called a workaholic because I uh, considered the weekends as play and the rest of the week as work. So uh, I you know, used to play hard and work hard. So, But then on the other hand, I was quite happy spending a day doing absolutely nothing. I mean, when I say nothing, I mean nothing. Just lying around reading, maybe get it, getting up to go to the fridge to eat something, but so I could, I could work hard, I could play hard, and I could, I guess you'd say, rest hard. <laughs> <laughs> Were you able to have like a normal day where you go to the university and work there, but when you go home you drop the work, or is it always in your brain? Oh sure, I mean certainly I could do that, because you know, I could combine my uh, hobbies like work during the day, and then do nothing uh, when, I, when I got home. So, you know, I said, you know, work hard and do nothing hard, so... <laughs> <laughs> but when you're working on something, do you have a feeling of how far you are coming in your research? Mm. Like, or do you, do no. you feel that you're close, or mm. are you mm. just blindsiding it? I generally, I'm lucky enough to be able to work on problems that interest me. Not things that I have to do, but um, problems that interest me. And so I guess you could call it a sort of hobby. Um, you know, it's really, it's not much more to say because the reason why I, I have been known to work hard is because I enjoyed what I was doing. But certainly, my other activities, I only do it because I enjoy it, not because uh, I have to, if you see what I mean. But I mean, for, for instance, there's no, you know, doing physics for a living, Listen, there's no money in it, because anybody who wants to do physics is certainly not going to get rich doing it. But it's uh, if you enjoy difficult puzzles, then 
it's a fun it's a fun subject to pursue but you've got to like it a lot because remember eventually you're going to have to go out and make a living and yes you could make a living doing physics for example but it's not going to be a good living so you've got to you know you're not going to, you're not going to have much money so you've got to really love it to, to uh, do it seriously How, how do you manage to keep the spark of curiosity and interest of learning burning throughout the years while you were studying? Well, that wasn't too hard because in physics there's always, always something new or, that, or something you don't understand or nobody else understands. I mean, for instance, look out the window at the natural world. The, uh, the, the job of a physicist to explain is to explain the natural world. And now, if you can explain everything you see um, through the window, you do, you're, you're much more knowledgeable than I am, because I, you know, I don't understand half of what I see. And so, but this is the job of a physicist, is to try to understand how the natural world works. Now, nothing to do with religion or anything like that. It, it's just trying to understand how the world we live in functions, what makes it tick. And there's, you know, you'll never ever um, get bored doing that because everywhere you look, there's something you don't understand. Well, I don't understand. Okay, so. Uh, you know, for that reason, I find it a fascinating subject. Uh, what scientific discovery do you think has been the most important leap of human knowledge? Ah. I've never thought about that. <laughs> I mean, how can you say what's most important because... Uh, One of the relatively recent things that has been very important is, of course, you know, the discovery of the transistor, because that was certainly you know, a piece of physics. Um, and then some bright people said, "Oh, wait a minute! This is applicable to uh, some uh, some electrical engineering problems, and hence we have the have computers, cell phones, and so on." But, but without the original discovery by a couple of physicists, we wouldn't have these marvelous devices that we have today. Today, Whether this is a good thing or a bad thing, that is not the business of physicists to decide. So physicists just try to increase knowledge about whatever, th whatever th uh, thing interests them. What the world does with those discoveries is not in the you know it's not it's got no um, well the, the physicists say that nothing to do with us it's it's if you want to kill yourselves with the knowledge we give you be my guest but uh, so I think one has to separate the pursuit you know the pursuit of knowledge from the applications of this knowledge because a lot of knowledge can be used for good or bad and of course, unfortunately, human beings g generally turn it into use the knowledge for bad things rather than good things. So, you know, I don't know what else to say about this. <laughs> what should, in your opinion, uh, the school curriculum focus on? Well, I, I guess the school curriculum should just focus on you know, learning as much about different things as you can as as you can. Because 
the more things one's exposed to at school, the better, because, you know, some people like to do one thing, other people like to do another thing, and so you, one ought to be presented with uh, as wide an array of, 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 of you know, possible you know, knowledge as, you, as one can. But uh, beyond that, I don't know what should be in a school curriculum. I mean, I suppose that it depends on what the teachers are able to teach, <laughs> rather than anything else. What was your doctorate project about? What did you do for it? Uh, it was a long time ago. Um, oh yeah, I was doing high energy physics, uh, and I was trying to calculate, what was it? something to do with things called regi poles. I seem to remember. So I was just doing whatever, whatever I could do for, for that. And you know, whatever problem I thought might uh, get, get me a PhD. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember how was long ago, but do you remember how lo uh, how the peer review process of your thesis paper was conducted, or and some of the flaws that you discovered either through your when you were writing it or that your peers discovered? Uh. Let's put it this way. In the paper that made Thales and, I f and me famous, or well known, uh, certainly w were uh, flaws because of def definitely, uh, you know, uh, a m an error in the paper. Uh, but the general ideas um, were, you know, were are certainly right. I do remember that I learned later that one of the that one of the referees admitted that he hadn't really understood what we'd done, but he thought, "Oh, I better let this go anyway." So uh, it did get published, but we were quite lucky that it it actually did get published. Anything on that matter on other studies you have or research you have done? Most, uh, well, everything else I've tried to do has been relatively trivial. And the papers that came out of that work really had no trouble in the getting through the refereeing system because uh, they were easy to understand because there wasn't much in them, <laughs> but it turned out this first paper had a lot more in it than 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 than, than either David or I realized. Uh, quite a long question. Uh, there has been quite a lot of talk about his how this type of research could impact the possibility of creating a functioning quantum computer. Would you say that your discovery will have an impact? Okay. That uh, question, uh, that particular question, should be better directed to my uh, my co laureate Duncan Haldane because I worked on purely classical systems, okay, uh, whereas Duncan Haldane worked on 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 quantum mechanical systems. It sort of applied the same, and David Thales worked on both. Now, the classical stuff will probably have no impact on quantum computer, but the work that's being done by Haldane and Thales on uh, in the quantum mechanical world 
makes it possibly less unlikely. Let, I won't say more likely, I'll, I'll use the phrase less unlikely, that a quantum computer will ever appear. The, the problem with quantum computing is, you know, it's trying, if you try to, you can, in principle, one can store information in the quantum wave function, but the system, the quantum mechanical system or the computer, if you want to use it to do something, has it ha this system has to interact with the outside world. Well, if you make a measurement, that's the measurement apparatus is the outside world. So, and if you uh, connect this quantum mechanical wave function with all the information encoded in it to the outside world, the uh, wave function tends to, uh, you know, degenerate. All the information gets lost. So, in that sense, a com quantum computer seemed to be impossible. But with recent developments, the it's possible you can you can. Uh, code the information into s into uh, so-called topological um, uh, quantities, which and so the information is then spread over the whole si over the whole system. So therefore, if something goes wrong with a local piece of the system, it won't uh, completely wipe out all the information. In other words, the information should be more more robust. And this is exactly what these topological things do. They're not local quantities, but they're really global things. And so the idea of a quantum computer becomes less unlikely. Maybe it's possible to build one uh, using these ideas. So it's I mean, we're a long, long way from being able to construct one. So the chances of, of me getting a desktop quantum computer um, uh, before I die are, are no longer zero, but they're maybe uh, you know, one, one in 10 million now. You know, no, uh, perhaps as you know, reasonable odds as good as winning a lottery or something. But so a quantum computer seems to be less impossible than it was. So let's say we already had functioning quantum computers. How much easier do you think your work would have been? <sighs> That's an impossible question because I haven't a clue how would one would use a quantum computer. Assuming I had one that worked, I, I wouldn't know how to, how to actually use it. So, what did you think about the presentation that the Nobel Committee uh, did uh, on your work? The one with the bagel, a cinnamon bun, and uh, a pretzel? Oh, it was clever. I mean, it, was a, it, was an, it was a nice way of getting over the ideas of, you know, the, of this, these mathematical ideas of topology, because <sighs> okay, you can say that w the sort of things that David and I did is in the classical case is that Yes, yes, topology is important, etc. But you don't need to under, to to use these words and think about the the uh, you know the mathematical topology of the system because actually uh, pictures will do it for you. And so, but in the quantum case, it gets a little bit more complicated, and so then the uh, these mathematical ideas become much more relevant. So from the presentation, which one of the pastries uh, would you prefer? Well, if you want, uh, you know, if one wants to communicate what topology is all about to the general public, and remember, the general public tends not. See, the trouble is with, you know, physics, math the language of physics is mathematics. And in general, 
the public does not speak mathematics, or not well, and so there's a major communication gap. So, if I thought that the bagels and the things uh, idea was a, was a quite neat way of getting over some of the concepts of topology, which, as I say, and these concepts are quite important in, uh, in this particular uh, field, it was a very nice way of getting those ideas over. See, for example, suppose you, you know, your, your quantum information, right? You need to somehow keep this information and so you can actually read it out at some point. There's no good having information that you can't access. So, if you can somehow encode the information into this topological object, you know, like the bagel, which has one hole, or the pretzel, which maybe has two holes, if you can sort of encode encode the information in this, you know, in this one hole thing versus a two hole thing or a versus a zero hole thing, then those objects are, are relatively stable. So, and it doesn't matter what happens in the, in the bulk of the, of the bagel or whatever, right? You can, you can stretch it and, and compress it and, and so on and so forth. But as long as you don't tear it or glue up the hole, the hole is going to remain. So you certainly know this, this one whole aspect of the bagel is going to persist. So in other words, your, your, your information is, is maintained or is stable. Does that answer your question? <laughs> Uh, the question was actually, which one would you do you think is the most uh, tastiest? But <laughs> I mean, okay, it's well, fine. that that depends on on what you like best. So I <laughs> won't go into that. Okay, so uh, for our final question is that a few years ago there was a study made that showed that Nobel Prize winners live on average two years longer than other others with the same lifestyle. That would mean that you tomorrow will receive an extra two years of life in addition to the price and the money. How will you spend this extra two years of life? I don't know. J just do what I do for two years more. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming. You're welcome. Yeah.